Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. Innovative and compassionate care worth the wait. Call 360-271-2530 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Anne Lovejoy. Hey, Karen. Hey. What's up with the garden? You know, a surprising amount. People sort of feel like, okay, it's over. But in fact, those little rains we've had the last few days, we've had some really nice sprinkles and they wake up a lot of flowers. And fall, you know, there's asters, there's chrysanthemums, there's still hydrangeas in a lot of places. Some of the roses are blooming again and a lot of repeat bloomers. And as I walked down here today, um, I picked a bunch of flowers just to sort of show you. I think one of the things uh, people sort of forget about, can you see this if I hold it up like that? Or should I? If you could put it out as far as you can. Like that? And then lower it. Lower it right there so we can see, use your forehead as the background. Oh, okay, is that pretty good? <laughs> up a little <laughs> bit more. There you go. Okay, I'll try to see where that is. Anyway, the hardy fuchsias, any upright fuchsia is hardy here in the Northwest. The draggly ones, those big ones with the big foofy crinoline skirt flowers, those ones not usually quite so hardy. But any of the ones that are kind of more upright bushy, they will bloom here and last. And sometimes they'll bloom into November, October. No, um, sometimes even at Christmas, I'll pick a few. And the reason that they're really good to keep in your gardens is because the hummingbirds love them. And there are lots of different kinds and sizes. When I had my big garden, I used to put in things like Maiden's Blush, which would be a five, six, even maybe seven foot shrub covered in soft pink flowers. And again, through like eight or nine months of the year and often having some blooms in Christmas time and those hummingbirds would love it. But now my yard is small. I'm planting a whole lot of little ones like Tom Thumb, which is about one foot high, but still covered with bloom all summer long. And I just find that I have about, oh, I don't know, 15 or 20 little hardy fuchsias tucked in pots here and there. And because they're so small, you can tuck them in almost anywhere. You could have them on your patio, but they're great because the Anna hummingbirds have gotten accustomed to being fed in the winter. So there's, for the last 20 or 30 years, they've been overwintering here, which they didn't always used to do. Um, and if you don't have a feeder, or even if you do, it's still great to have a few flowers that they can take advantage of. And those hardy fuchsias are going to be your best hummingbird friends, really all summer long, but well into winter as well. Um, and they're beautiful, beautiful friends. <laughs> they're beautiful and they're almost effortless. They really don't need a whole lot of primping. And one thing to remember with a lot of those long flowering plants is that if you dump on a lot of fertilizer, they'll go to leaf and they won't have as many blooms. So you want to use a pretty low number fertilizer if to, you, know, you do want to keep them going, but it's more like a 555 rather than those 10-10-10s or 10-20-10s that some of the big bloom boosters use. That's not going to work on those long-term plants. Uh, another one that is probably the most, it doesn't really look like a lot, I know, but, and I'm going to try to put it right where you said. You know, why, why don't you lower it to the white table? The white table is a great background for oh, it. Oh, can you see it better like this? Yeah, I think so. Just up a little higher. And there, there, that's better. Oh, oh that's okay. right there. It's good. Okay. I'll try to remember it. So this is called Agastache. And it looks like Agastache, but it's not. And it has the square stems that tell you it's in the mint family. And this one is called Tutti Frutti. But there's a <laughs> ton of them, and they're in different colors. But I have to say that all summer long... This thing has bloomed and bloomed and bloomed and bloomed. And when I picked it this morning, it was I had to shake off three or four bees. There's a ton left. Don't worry. I didn't pick them all. Um, but if you're trying to help the pollinators out, this is a plant that native pollinators and all the hummingbird bees and the um, humming bees, hummingbirds actually do like this because you can see it's a little bit tubular. But the honeybees and the bumblebees all love this plant. Um, it's almost effortless as long as you remember that it likes to be a little bit on the dry side and it doesn't want a whole lot of fertilizer. And it thrives on that magic formula called benign neglect, which to me is like fabulous because at this point in my life, benign neglect is great, right? Exactly. Um, and so the whole group of the 
Agastiki family. And it's Agastiki, not Agastash, because as you all know perfectly well, in Greek, the antepenultimate syllable always takes the stress, right? I mean, we know that, duh, right? So Agastiki, right? Another one that's similar is the Penstemons. And now Penstemons are great because they're native. We have a lot of native Penstemons in Washington, down into Oregon and California. Um, there are different forms that are selected for color. This one's actually sort of a little bit more to the uh, southwest called Red Rocks. But almost all the Penstemons are going to bloom and then rebloom if you cut them back. So they'll bloom really hard in like June, July, maybe into August, and then they kind of peter out, cut them back, water them a little. You can feed them gently, again, maybe like a 555, and they'll burst back into bloom. And you'll see that they are hummingbird attractive as well as... We have people who are attending in person. Oh, okay. Thank Welcome. So That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. So you have an audience in person as well. Cool. I love it. We're a hybrid. Yay. We're a hybrid. Yeah. So should you plug in or what? If you're hybrids, should we That's right. Right? We need to give them a little extra electricity. Should I too? No, no, you're fine. Okay. Fully vaccinated here. Yeah, we are too. Anyway, thank you. So this is interesting. This is our new format. I kind of love it. I was just talking about long blooming plants that pollinators love. And the penstemons, which are both native and introduced, um, are really good long performers and they bloom and bloom and bloom if you cut them back give them a little bit of water and not much fertilizer i was talking earlier about how you don't want to over fertilize flowering plants because they'll go to leaf same with your tomatoes you may have noticed if you give them a lot of fertilizer early in the season you'll get fabulous foliage yeah. but really they're not going to put on the fruiting that you want to see from those tomatoes so i don't give them heavy feeding until they start to set fruit then you're safe and you can start giving them more. And with the tomatoes, I did want to mention that right now we're starting to see late blight coming and getting, making the plants wilt and look terrible. One thing you can do to avoid that is to mulch as heavily as possible with coffee grounds starting in, again, after fruit set begins. So usually like, I'd say for around here, July, really, um, once the plant starts putting out actual fruit, not just flowers, you can start mulching with used coffee grounds. Now it's odd, but it's 911, it's high nitrogen. And there's something in the coffee, which I don't remember exactly what it is, but it combats some of the fungal disorders. And so late blight can actually be either really minimized or completely avoided by mulching with coffee grounds. And if you don't drink coffee, surely your neighbor does. I mean, everybody else in the normal world does. And I just read an interesting study that said people who are moderate coffee drinkers, which is between one and three cups a day, have actually a much higher quality of life and are less prone to heart disorders and strokes and so forth. So sip another cup, Karen. I saw you drinking your coffee earlier. It's good for what it makes you feel better, right? Awesomeness. So with coffee is helpful for bees and plants too, because it's gonna make those flowers um, grow better and stronger. Another flower that I wanted to talk about is a perennial uh, sunflower. Is that pretty good, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So perennial sunflowers are native to the Midwest and um, there are lots of different kinds and different sizes too. Like some will be eight or 10 feet, some will be, you know, two feet. These tend, this is an old fashioned form that's called um, lemon queen, but it's a pretty aggressive. She was the queen that took over a lot of land. So you don't want lemon queen unless you have a lot of space for lemon queen. But I got to say pollinator heaven, this is a really persistent long blooming plant that is tough and enduring, does not need a lot of water, does not need any fertilizer. In fact, don't encourage it. But it will grow really well in an abandoned, neglected place or if you don't have time to deal, but you want to have something pretty and cheerful, lemon queen is your pal. She's a good one. Another one that's really starting to bloom nicely these days, these are um, the uh, Schizostylus, and they come from South Africa. 
And there's a new name for it, which I do not remember, and I don't know that I'm ever going to learn. So schizostylus is good enough. Um, they're sometimes called river lilies or coral lilies, and they bloom in pink and red and rose. And this coral one, which I think is really pretty, is called Oregon Sunset. Mm -hmm. um, but these kind of bloom from now into sometimes March. So they're really nice winter bloomers. The drawback to this particular plant, it likes crappy soil, doesn't need a whole lot of sun, doesn't need much water, but it starts to look really ratty and the, uh, the old leaves turn black. I mean black, it's kind of dramatic. So they're great Halloween plants, but after that they start to really look a little dubious and I kind of pull the black part bits off. They'll form big fat clumps of seeds and seed themselves around. Um, they're uh, not aggressive, but they're pretty willing to spread, put it that way. And they're easy, easy to pull out, so they're not terrible. But they form fat little bulbs. You can share them easily with your neighbors. And if your neighbor has some, ask for some bulbs, because I'm sure they'll share with you. Um, but great long bloomer, almost effortless, really nice for those winter pollinators that are looking for a little help. Um, but also great as a cut flower, it lasts really quite well um, in, in arrangements and things too, which is another nice bonus, right? When I was picking this morning, I went through and was looking at who's busy. And almost all the plants in my little pollinator patch were buzzing already with bees. But the one that really is covered almost all the time is mint. Now, mint is nothing I planted. It was there when I came. It will be there when I die. Um, mint is perpetual. But I let it I have mostly, my plants are mostly in troughs because I have such a limited tiny place and I put them in those water troughs uh, which have holes in the bottom and drainage and they're raised up on blocks and they make great raised beds. But the mint sort of romps around the ground level underneath them, sticks through, comes up the sides and I let it because the bees love it. And everything I've planted in my troughs gets pollinated and so I have much better success with things like, you know, beans and zucchini and, you know, all the um, tomatoes actually too. Tomatoes are self-fertile to a degree, but they do better if they get a little help. And one of the interesting things about them is that when bees pollinate them, they sit on a, they stand or sit on a leaf outside the blossom and they vibrate their wings at middle C. And the pollen just cascades down. Middle C is the magic, magic tone for pollination. Um, and even now, you know, it's getting late in the season, but don't pull out your tomatoes unless they are showing signs of distress because they're still going to be ripening. We may not get much more heat, but it's not supposed to get cold either. And as long as there's a little sun and it's warm in the afternoons, so our tomatoes are still plugging along. Uh, I had several people ask me, is it even worth bothering to try to bring them in and I say, of course it is. You know, even if it does get cold and wet, cut your tomato plants. And I put them in egg cartons so they have air circulation around them and they're separated. They're not touching each other. Um, but those paper egg cartons are perfect because they'll absorb any excess moisture. And they don't need to be in direct sun, but I put them like in my kitchen, usually on the counter or on a sunny windowsill, and they will ripen up um, eventually. And you can put them in a paper bag with a banana. Bananas put off a lot of ethylene gas, and that really helps them um, ripen well. And even though you picked them and brought them inside, they'll still taste better than the store-bought ones, mm -hmm. which, you know, are really sometimes shipped thousands of miles before they get here. This just made the trip from your garden to your kitchen. It's not going to suffer that bad, right? The other thing you can think about is if you have big ones that aren't ripening very well, it, you might want to do some green tomato things, like you can make fabulous chutney with green tomatoes instead of use a mango chutney recipe and just chop up green tomatoes instead or put in green tomatoes and apples makes a really good one or peaches. That's a beautiful combination. Also, you can cut them in half and put them cut side up on a rimmed baking sheet, sprinkle a little sea salt or basil salt, my favorite, and bake them at 225 indefinitely. And I mean three, four <laughs> hours, sometimes longer. And they'll get chewy and delicious and it wakes up their latent sweetness and they start to caramelize. And you get this really interesting flavor that's sort of a nice sweet tart balance um, that's a little different. And I freeze them at that point or put them in a sauce or soup. 
um, and they're fabulous and they make a really nice side dish if you grill chicken or fish or something like that. Um, caramelized green tomatoes, everybody will say, oh my God, what is that? It's so good. Uh, and it is, it's delicious. So that's a good way to handle your glut of greens, right? It's also a good way to handle red ones if you have a lot of red ones. Um, same kind of thing, you basically cut them in half or quarter them if they're big and put them cut side up, sprinkle a little salt. I rub the backs with a little teeny bit of avocado oil or olive oil, not a ton, um, but just, and then cook them very slowly. The red ones can go at 300, um, but the green ones seem to do better at like 225. They're just low and slow, and it's almost like braising or something. They just get so tender and delicious. I forgot to say that I usually do um, just rub the pan with a little oil before I put them in. Um, and you can do the same with the reds. And the reds, like I said, can go at 300. And for an hour or more, and I'd start tasting it about then, they're not gonna burn at that temperature, but they can sort of, what they happens is they collapse and they don't look very attractive, <laughs> but my, they taste good. And the, again, they become a little bit almost chewy and they make a great side dish uh, and you can freeze them. I pack them into freezer packs and freeze them. And then in the middle of the winter, when you pull it out and add it to a sauce or a soup, it just, it's like a much fresher taste than a can of something, right? So it's a nice way to kind of bring summer up on into the winter time. Does that say something? <clears throat> That's a great idea. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. And it, I think I've talked about basil salt before, but I'll give you a reminder because it's the end of the season. It's starting to come in and a lot of people are saying, I am so done with pesto. Do I have to keep making pesto? And no. You don't, but you can use it cup for cup with kosher salt or sea salt and grind it in your grinder. I, mean, I use a Cuisinart, but whatever. Grind it up. It makes a really nice, rich green paste. Put it in that good old rimmed baking sheet again, 225, and leave it there till it forms a crust. And not very long. It's usually about 20 minutes. I like to just make an even layer um, so that it makes almost like a little pancake. And then you hit it with a spatula and when it cracks in pieces, you know it's done. Take it out, let it cool, put it back in the Cuisinart and grind it up again and it will last. And then put it in a jar. It needs to be stored out of sunlight. It should be in a dim, cool place, dry, of course. Um, but I put them in canning jars. And then come Christmas, you can package that up in little fancy jars from the grocery store and it tastes incredible. And people are so excited to have, again, a taste of summer. You can also do that with rosemary or rosemary, garlic, and lemon peel. I didn't do, I don't do quite as strong a percentage. Like with the basil salt, half and half is like one to one is good. With the others, I would say probably to a cup of salt, I would probably do a quarter cup of other stuff. Like the strip the rosemary stems, chop up the garlic a little bit, cut a peel off a couple of lemons, then grind all that stuff up together. That is really important that you get it crusty and dry in the oven because otherwise those things are so moist they're going to mold a little bit and get gross. But if you bake it till it's crisp and then regrind it, and if you feel like it's not quite done, put it back in the oven and make sure it's really dry, it will keep indefinitely, like several years, and still have very strong flavor and, and fragrance. And it's incredible on like scrambled eggs or steamed vegetables or fish or almost anything. It gives it a really wonderful flavor. Can you tell that I really like cooking? <laughs> <laughs> and I love cooking from the garden. Yeah. One of the funnest things for me is I take my teapot out in the morning and I go to that ubiquitous mint and I start stripping off the mint leaves and a few flowers. And I'll put in some rose petals and some chamomile and some lemon balm, right? And all these fun things that are growing all over the place, whether you want them to or not. And just cover it with boiling water and let it steep for 10, 15 minutes and then Pour it through your little, I have a little strainer cup thing, and then a little honey or a little maple syrup. Or you could use what my granddaughter loves to make. We've been making lavender sugar and rose petal sugar. And that's you take this plain old cane sugar um, and put in, again, for like a cup of sugar, I put in a half a cup of lavender or flowers or little, you know, when you, right now, when you strip lavender, the flowers are gone, but the seed, the buds are there from the seeds, seed pods, and they're also very fragrant, and they're also quite flavorful. So you can strip those, 
mix them together. My granddaughter puts them in a canning jar, shakes them up, and then we put the tight top on tight and let it stand for three weeks or a month. And again, then you're going to sift it out, though she likes to leave a few of the petals or the flowers in there for looks, and it does look nice. But I have to say, if you put a big spoonful in your tea and there's a lot of lavender buds in it, yeah. <laughs> it's not very nice. <laughs> so I put it through the strainer. But the rose petals, same way, use your most fragrant roses. And of course, they have to be plants that you've never used pesticide on because we can't, I have to be organic. Uh, but rose petals, just as they're starting to fall, are full of those rose oils. And so they'll keep that uh, flavor and fragrance. And you can put it in the sugar and again, let it sit for three to four weeks, and then it will be incredibly fragrant, which is really fun. Um, you can also make tea out of them, but you and then you can also just dry the petals for potpourri, which is another thing we do. Um, dried lavender, dried rose petals, dried um, calendula petals too. I brought some calendulas. <laughs> So, and they are orange or yellow or sort of cafe au lait even or brighter colors now. Calendulas are called calendar flowers because they really bloom almost every month of the year. When I was a student in Italy, I was, couldn't believe there'd be these buckets of these gorgeous sunny flowers in the middle of the winter. And I'd say, what is that? And they would say, calendula, right? And they really do for us too. They'll, as long as you keep them pinched back, they will keep on blooming and blooming and blooming and blooming. And again, they're a boon to the wintry bees on sunny, warm days when they wake up, there's something for them to eat. But they're also great for, you can use them in salads. They make a beautiful garnish. Um, if you have chickens, if you feed them the petals, the yolks of your eggs will be incredibly golden, beautiful color. But you can also just use them in, uh, in a potpourri right, for color and scent. And that's one of the things we enjoy doing. This year, I, a friend of mine gave me last year a calendula salve, and I have rosacea, so I like to put it on my face. And you take a quart of calendula petals. Oh my gosh, we've been saving the petals all summer long. <laughs> and they have to dry out, so you put them on another rim. I have a lot of rimmed baking sheets. So I get them at yard sales and stuff like that. Even the funky ones. I put the petals on them out of the direct light and they'll dry. And then you can put them in a jar. Just keep saving them and saving them. But you take those and you put them with like two cups of organic uh, coconut oil and heat the coconut oil gently in a double boiler and put the petals in and you heat it for about half an hour. Just steam it. Oh, you know, so it's a double boiler. It's not in the water, but it's warm. And then you strain that and let it firm up and it'll be this sort of soft golden color and it's incredible for your skin. Mm -hmm. And you can do that with rose petals too, rose facial salve. And again, those are lovely presents. And if you have grandkids or neighborhood kids that are your own kids that you wanna play with, uh, wonderful, easy, simple crafts that really make nice gifts. I do love playing in the garden. <laughs> Here's another favorite, this is oregano. And it's a special one called Amethyst Falls. And you can see it's got these fun little reticulated scales like fish tails. Aren't they beautiful? Mm -hmm. I put a few of these out in the garden at the senior center um, and hopefully they'll get to be a pretty nice big. We have in our senior center garden, you might wanna walk by and take a look because there are, I think I put in eight or 10 kinds of oregano, golden oregano, Greek mountain oregano, carpeting oregano, miniature oregano, and they're all beautiful and fragrant, but they all bloom like crazy. And again, they're hugely popular with pollinators. And you can also, of course, cook with them, dry them, make oregano salt for your pizza, right? All kinds of things like that. Um, but they're one of the easiest plants for a hot, dry, sunny place without, with terrible soil. Perfect. Like oregano would be absolutely happy. Plants that grow in the rocks in Greece are gonna be absolutely happy to be in your worst soil in the sun between the driveway and the trash can, or whatever, <laughs> right? They're perfect <laughs> for that kind of yeah. place that you wouldn't, you know, put a good, good plant, but that's, boy, you can have a lot of fun watching the pollinators on your oregano. What else have I got here? Oh yeah, so verbena. Um, it's another really long bloomer and there's lots of kinds and colors. 
of these. And they didn't used to be hardy here, but you know, interestingly, the last four or five years, they have wintered over effortlessly and they just keep on coming. So I'm using these a lot more in gardens. We're starting to sort of shift the things we grow and notice plants that used to be killed off easily. Now, most of them are becoming more persistent because our winters have changed, much more mild. One thing that we got to think about with the changing climate is that a lot of plants that didn't used to need any water in winter at all, some of them might now. And you have to be aware of that and be thinking about, especially if you've transplanted something, you planted a new fruit tree for this year, or you're putting in perennials in the fall like we always do, keep your eye on them because the kind of rains we've had are lovely and refreshing, but all they did is give a little sparkle. If you dig your, with your finger down, it's dry as a yeah. bone, half an inch down, right? Mm -hmm. So for a lot of plants, they're going to struggle unless we make sure that it sounds crazy to say you might have to water in winter, but it's really important if you've just, like I said, transplanted something or put in a young plant. And even some of our native plants have been struggling. Uh, and so if you live in a wooded area, one of my friends, uh, we used to tease him a lot because he would water the, the native trees, but you know, his are really healthy and the neighboring trees are not. Uh, in the last week, we're still in, in a pretty long, prolonged drought yeah. uh, and we have not been getting, and the water distribution, sometimes it comes into about the same amount, but it's, it doesn't really add up if we get a, drip, a dribble here and a dribble there. We need those good soaking so, rains. Um, but I am starting to really think in a different way about the kinds of plants um, th that I can rely on, put it that way. Uh, I don't use camellias as much as I used to, but I'm using a lot more crepe myrtles. In fact, we put crepe myrtles out front, and if you come by the senior center, you'll see we have two beautiful bushes that are bright, rosy red flowers, and they've been blooming since we put them in in early May, and they are still blooming. And now crepe myrtles was something that used to not be hardy here, and we didn't think they were reliable at all. But new hybrids have been grown there are crepe myrtles that are native to the southwest of America and up into some northern climates even. And so they've been breeding with some of those cold hardier uh, species and finding that they can make really colorful, beautiful plants that actually live through our winters and bloom here. Because some of them would live through the winter, but they wouldn't bloom. Like, oh great, what's the point of that? <laughs> oh, but some of these newer ones have incredible peely, beautiful bark that's rich and beautiful in the winter time. And they have really nice fall color and the blooms last for months and months. They're funny because they're pretty drought tolerant, but they need water when they're blooming. So if you remember to give them a little extra water during the, their actual bloom time, they'll perform a lot better. And the nice thing about them too is they're not huge trees. Sadly, we a lot of our lots are smaller than they used to be, and we don't really have room for the great big gorgeous trees we used to be able to put in. If you're lucky and you do, go for it. Plant a chestnut, you know, or something. But a lot of us have to make sure that we're not going to put in a tree that's going to have to be cut down all too soon because we put it right next to the house, or it's under the telephone wires, or it's hanging over the neighbor's yard and they cut their half off, which, by the way, is legal. It's kind of bizarre, but if you plant a tree on the property line, your neighbor has every legal right to cut every branch off their side if they don't like it, mm. which isn't going to look good or be healthy for your plant or probably for your relationship with your neighbors, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, please jump in if you have specific questions and things you were interested in knowing. Does anybody? Um, I do. Oh, Christina. Great, Christina. So, yeah. I, I've explained before, I just have this little patch that I've been trying to keep up because the person who lived in this apartment before me was a gardener, and I'm just trying to keep it going. Um, so she had some irises, but the, the last couple of years that I've been here, they haven't really come up, but I see the bulbs or the knuckles sort of coming above the um, soil. So should I, do, I mean, should I divide those up? and replant them? Is that the reason why they're not really coming up and doing anything? No, gosh, it sounds like they might be dead. Um, oh. Irises are pretty, you know, iris, boy, if you have a very small garden, that is a plant that really doesn't necessarily earn its keep. Uh, because even if they're doing well, they bloom for such a short period. 
and then all you have is the foliage, which isn't always all that attractive. Um, and if what you have is the nubbles of the bulbs, but you don't have any leaves or flowers, I'm going to say that's a dig me up and throw me out situation or put it on the compost heap or in your green waste or somebody's green waste. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, little, little gardens, everything has to earn its place. Everything in it should make you happy when you see it. Everything in it should be rewarding and beautiful to you or useful or both. And if it's just sort of something, yeah, move on. Uh, and maybe that patch of ground isn't that great. That's really possible too. Um, especially close to town, a lot of the older places are built on soil that was scraped down. It's just subsoil uh, and there was no there there. And so unless you build it up and really spend some time every year putting on compost and manure and so forth, it's really not going to be very productive. But that's where a nice big pot or even a trough, like I was talking about earlier, those things will be great for you. Put them up on some blocks so they get air circulation underneath. Then you can have nice, good, fresh potting soil in there and grow whatever gives you pleasure. You know, if it's sunny, you can have lavender and rosemary and herbs for the garden, for the kitchen. Or if it's shady, you can put some ferns in and have, and those hardy fuchsias I talked about earlier, they're great in sun or shade. And they, they're teeny ones, like I was saying, like eight inches or 12 inches high. And there's beautiful ones that are two and three feet. And they bloom and bloom and bloom. And they're just hummingbird magnets and bumblebee magnets. And so if you don't have much space, a long blooming plant like that, that brings in a lot of life, that might be a better choice than a handful of bulbs that have had their moment mm. and are ready to move on. And can you, I, I noticed the library, which I know that you helped garden there too, or helped garden, I don't know what the current status. There is, there's these huge fuchsias and I got a fuchsia that was in a pot and I thought it's gonna die if I keep it in the pot. So I went ahead and put it in the garden. Is it too late for me to do that? Am I gonna kill it anyway? No, no, it's a good idea. The ones okay. at the garden, in the, at the library, you're right. I've been uh, facilitating the garden volunteers, the Friday tidy volunteers, for 22 years. <laughs> and I'm not bored yet. Isn't that amazing? Oh, isn't that fun? And so every Friday morning, people show up and we putter around and pull things out and put things in. But no, this is, you know, it's starting to be planting time. Uh, I would say you got to keep your eye on the, it's going to be dry. So you want to make sure you get it watered, but, and give it some compost. Um, it will definitely like that. It doesn't need fertilizer, but compost is really good. And and watch it all winter. Make sure that it stays moist enough. A lot of times, though, these heavier soils, if you dig a hole, you'll notice it will fill up with water and it doesn't actually drain very fast. If you don't have perk, you're probably better off just getting a bigger pot and keeping it in a pot or half barrel, like that size of pot. Um, I've uh, uh, always collect pots from friends who grow plant trees and things like that. And I grab all their tree pots or their bigger pots that they're putting out for the trash collection. I was like, are you kidding me? Um, and you can go to Lowe's. Lowe's has, every Lowe's store has a bin where they you can leave off pots, empty pots, or you can pick up empty pots. And so they don't throw anything like that away. And so you can take clean sorted pots there and pick up. And sometimes you'll see these really nice, you know, tree pots or whatever. And I take those home and make sure the one thing to really watch for is a lot of the plastic big pots have to have a hole knocked in the bottom and there'll be a, a mark where there's a place for it, but the drain holes are not punched out, not necessarily. And so they can fill up with water and you can drown your plants. So make sure that you knock those holes out if you can see them in the bottom. And I usually take a, a big screwdriver, the flat kind, and then hit it with a little hammer and knock the punch hole out and that um, makes sure that you have good drainage in it. But it's much easier to do that before you plant it and drown a plant than afterward. Let me just <laughs> tell you from, ask me how I know that, right? <laughs> I have a question about uh, dahlias. I have a plant that's been doing pretty well. Do I need to be uh, pulling up the dahlia at the end of the season and replanting it? Great question. We used to say yes, and now we say no. Uh, in fact, dahlias are another one of those plants that climate creep is giving us a real edge on because 
like I have one at the library that's been in the ground for 15 years and it's doing fine. If you're concerned and you think um, you're not so sure and this is the first year, put a extra, put a, some compost on top and then wood chips, a couple inches of wood chips on top of it. That's a little insulation that will help it um, stay a little warmer gives you a few degrees of protection but it's so i'm guessing i'm guessing you're going to say that's probably a good idea anyway it is a good idea anyway <laughs> i was just getting to that but the thing i was uh, thinking first is like we used to say you know frost rarely penetrates more than a few inches into the soil here but in fact I mean, these days it's rare that it gets that far like even in the big february snow a couple years ago remember that huge yeah. snow um, I was astounded to see that in the garden, if you push the snow away, the ground was not frozen. Now, snow is insulating, so it would keep it at about 32, but it meant that the ground did not freeze very deep at all. And so we lost almost nothing about from the cold, but some things got broken by the weight of the snow, especially when it froze later. That's a whole nother story. But yeah, any to protect your soil, like right now, if you're starting to harvest and you're hauling stuff out of the garden and you never leave soil bare, bare soil is an abomination to nature, which will move right in and put all kinds of weeds there for you, for starters. But also if we do get our good winter rains, erosion is gonna be a problem because you're gonna lose soil quality. So what I usually do in the autumn time is like remove the dead plants. If it's perennials, you're in a perennial bed, you can actually do chop and drop like chop the leaves and let them fall. I use my little clippers. These are my favorite little um, garden snips and they are by ARS, professional um, pruning shears. ARS, we used to always joke that it meant always reasonably sharp. <laughs> I had a pair for like 18 years and I never had to sharpen it. Wow. Um, I know, they're amazing. And they're grape snips and they've got a nice little curve to the tip so you don't poke a hole in your pocket, which is really cool. The ends are curved so you don't stab yourself when you put it in your pocket, which I always do. They have these little handy annoying clips to keep them closed at the bottom, but if you're not careful, they catch themselves and cut and make themselves shut. So I always try to pull them up like this, and then when they break, I don't cry. But um, but these are really wonderful tools for all kinds of things, especially just like snipping your way through the garden. But when you do the chop and drop, you just are remembering that leaves are containers and they're full of nutrients. And the nutrients are specifically designed for the plant they came from. So when you chop them and leave them beside the plant that yeah. shed them, <laughs> just let it be there. If it, if it looks funky to you, just cut it up in little pieces because that's actually going to speed the decomposition. The more cut edges there are, the faster bacteria and other things can work on degrading that in place. And that releases the nutrients to the soil, which takes it to the roots, which gives it there for next year. So and if you don't like the look, again, put a little compost on top and then the wood chips. And wood chips, not bark. Bark is a disaster in the garden. It sheds water and a lot of it's dyed, which is ridiculous, but shredded up wood is really an excellent, whole wood, like an arborist chip, um, is an excellent protection for the soil. It keeps it from getting too hot and dry in the summer. It keeps it from eroding in the winter. It's some protection against weeds germinating, some will, but that amount of shade that it casts um, is enough to suppress a lot of weeds from germinating. And winter is the big time for weeds. It's their favorite time. December, January, February is when all the weed seeds start to sprout. And <laughs> it's so annoying. But they're called weeds of disturbance because also uh, they like light and air. They like cool, moist weather. And they like exposure to, this, to ambient temperature. And if they get disturbed because you're pulling something up, that triggers them to grow. So that's sort of the opposite of our vegetables and annuals where we sow them carefully and cover them with, with dirt. Weeds of disturbance don't like that. They, and so whenever you pull up a weed, you're setting their cousins free, right? Wee, now we're gonna go sprout everywhere. So that extra mulch is really protective and helps you have a, less of a weed problem too. So you mulch and then you put wood chips on top of the mulch. Yeah, and an inch or so of wood chips on top of the mulch. And then come spring, all you have to do, pull it aside, plant. If you don't like the look of the wood chips, put more compost on top of those. You can just keep layering. You never have to take them off. The one time I use them heavily in places where I'm going to garden, 
I'll put a big deep, uh, lots of full autumn leaves. This is definitely the time as they start to fall. That's treasure. So put the leaves down and cover them with wood chips or bird netting with some stones on it to keep them from blowing away. And then they'll rot down in place and enrich your soil. Uh, and that's like garden gold, definitely want that. If you have a moss garden that you like, or a mossy area, you don't want the leaves all over that. But I put bird netting down, let the leaves fall, roll it up a couple times a week and take it and shake it out where you do want those leaves and then put the netting back down and it will keep the moss from getting smothered. You can do that on lawns too, on the grassy area. Though if you're mowing still, just mow the leaves and they'll get chipped up and dropped like a, like a mulching mower and just enrich the soil as well. What great two suggestions using the, the, the bird netting to gather the leaves and going to Lowe's. I had no idea about the pots at Lowe's. Yeah, I don't think they advertise it as such, but I talked to the manager of several stores in Silverdale and they said, oh yeah, we all do it. We, um, it's just a service because we don't want to add to the plastic burden of the, you know, and nursery, nursery plastic is a real problem. So anything we can recycle is really valuable. And in fact, you know, if you grow your own seeds or you think you'd like to start, then when you start planting out things in those four inch pots, you save those, knock them clean or rinse them off, let them dry and stack them up. And you can save those and plant again in them and use them for years, years. If they're really funky, um, you can actually just rinse them in uh, a bucket that has a little bleach water in it and that will clean them right up. Uh, but rather than buy new ones or buy seed trays or anything like that, you don't need to do that. You can do a really, it's easy. In fact, lots of the hardy annuals are good to sow in the fall. And if you want to sow them, not necessarily by scattering them in place, you can line up some little pots, put them in a tray and put your annual seeds in those pots and then then when they come up you'll know where you want to put them but anything you start to sow now next few months um, will be up and running early in the spring before the things in the nursery are even ready yet so this is a great time to plant stuff like sweet alyssum and calendulas and clarkia um, godisha that clarkia welcome to spring is actually native to the northwest and it's one of the early bird uh, native plants that's gonna come up and bloom for you. And they usually, once you get them going, they'll usually self-sow and you'll have them uh, sowing themselves around the garden. And once the plants are up and you know what they are, that's another good reason to plant a few in pots because then you can identify, is that a weed or is that something I meant to have there? Uh, and then you can move them where you want them too, but yeah. I actually, <laughs> I've, I know I've talked about this before. My grandkids think that my recycling bin is their art treasure uh, supply box. And I do too. And I use things like yogurt, big quart yogurt containers. I'll cut them in strips and use those as plant markers because they don't go away, you know, but, uh, and the crows never carry those off. I don't know why they don't like yogurt probably. <laughs> But we use those and I use those boxes that salad come in. My neighbor gets those and I save the boxes and I can, you can put a little soil in there and grow microgreens. If you sow lettuce and kale and things like that, they'll pop up and you can just snip them with scissors and have them in your salads and stuff when they're a couple inches high. It's like mini greens all winter, right? Microgreens. Microgreens. Oh. I know, you can pay a lot for them. Or you sunny can... window or? Yeah, yeah. 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 And because they've already got air holes and, and you know, yeah. and you can put the top down and it's kind of like a little greenhouse for it and then pop it up. So I do that too. Oh, that's fabulous. Hey, listen, I, one thing, I, we have let our uh, uh, lettuce go to seed. You know, we pulled leaves off and it was done. It's, it bolted and uh, two kinds and then the uh, basil. And I'll tell you, the bees are enjoying the flowers. Absolutely. Yes. And the cool thing is if you, if the bees enjoy the flowers, which they do of almost all vegetables, um, and they're edible as well, if you wanted to toss a few in a salad. Um, but what will happen is they will pollinate those flowers, the flowers will set seed, and you can actually grow your own lettuce from your own lettuce seed. I know, right? You could use it in it. your microgreens all winter. Save those. <laughs> seeds. <laughs> I love it. My grandkids and I were picking fennel seeds 
because the fennel has all, of course, gone to seed. And so we pick them and let them dry and then rub them in our hands and then put them through a little sieve and clean them up. And then you can make fennel salt or you can just have fennel seeds, which I usually toast in a little bit of oil when I'm making curry. I'll put fennel seeds in. Uh, it's also nice with a lot of Italian dishes, like fennel seeds and garlic as a start. And almost doesn't matter what you do after that, it's gonna be really tasty, right? Um, but it's fun to harvest that from your own garden, right? Uh, and again, you can grow them, put them in with your little homemade salad mix if you have kale that's flowering or lettuces that are flowering, any greens like that, or even beets and things like that, chard. Uh, save all those seeds after they form. Now, some I leave for the birds because the other cool thing is if you let those things go to seed, you will have birds coming into the garden to find them. This summer has been so fun. In my pea patch, I have sunflowers that are covered with beans and the bean stalks grow up them, right? And then they have sunflowers sticking up at the top and the birds have been eating them, cleaning them clean. And first they eat the green seeds and then as they ripen, they go in and pick the riper seeds and they actually have like pick them out so that the end, the center is just bare. And it's great, all kinds of birds love them. And to me, the, the life of the garden is more than the plants. It's also the birds and the bees, right? And we even have, Pea patch bunnies. I know. Yeah, everybody has bunnies now because the coyotes got that parva virus, I guess, from dogs or something. Um, so the coyote population has really dipped in the last couple of years. So, and raccoons similarly were kind of low census for quite a while. The raccoons are starting to come back. I have not, coyotes are not coming back as quickly. And so the rabbits are multiplying like crazy and they are everywhere. We never had rabbits and this year there's rabbits everywhere. All over the yard. Yeah, yeah. It used to be the only rabbits you would really see on the island were at Battle Point, Battle Point Park. Park. Everybody would release their rabbits when they go, the kids went to college. It's like, you take the bunnies, to, to, Battle the bunnies to Battle Point. So you'd see black ones, white ones, gray ones. Now we see, we're seeing these little wild types yeah. that are small and beigey brown mm -hmm. um, that I did not used to see at all. But again, it's because there's no, the you know, the food chain has been disrupted. And so the, the rabbits are here. Now in our pea patch, it's interesting. They mostly eat carrot tops. They have not touched arugula or radicchio. They're apparently not Italian rabbits. They don't eat the herbs that I put in. Um, they haven't eaten my lettuce either. It's like, what is wrong with these creatures? I do not know. But they do like those carrot tops. It's interesting. And wow. Your squash? They're nibbling on the edges of the squash. Oh, interesting. When they're, when they're little. <laughs> yeah, of course. Like, who wants a big woody squash? Right, right? it's little, and, <laughs> and you go out there, and I thought it was, like, rats or something, but it's bunnies that are, like, nibbling on the face. And isn't it weird that a bunny should seem cute and a rat should seem repugnant when really... But they're both rodents. <laughs> yeah, they're both rodents, and he really wants them eating your stuff. But, yeah, um, and I have to say, I, I don't really grudge a little here and there. What I mind is when they take one bite of it out of everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy making. Um, we have, this was a good plum year for a lot of people. Italian plums, my plums. Yeah, the Italian prune plums were fantastic this year. Um, but it was, they were so abundant that the they couldn't keep up. We actually harvested a ton of clean, nice fruit because there were too many for the pests to get, get to first. Oh no. Can I ask you a question about your summer prune, not, not tomato question, but your article about summer fruit trees yeah, pruning? Yeah, sure. So now, like, well, I still have apples and Asian, I mean, I still have fruit on the tree, but then, so once the fruit is off, is it a good time? It's a good time to do to do certain kinds of pruning. Like the suckers. The suckers, the water shoots, which, you know, if you have a stat, a, a, the ones that go straight up like this are called water shoots. Yeah. And those always those. come off. And this is a good time still to do that. Okay. And then at the base of a tree, if there's been any injury to the roots or um, a lot of times you'll get suckering from the root base, this is a good time to take those off too. If you do that in winter, in winter, the whole tree is hormonally triggered to sprout and grow and it can just make it do it sprout where than ever but if you right. do it now um it, it, it does not trigger that same response do I wait until the fruit is off the tree you don't have to oh okay yeah I you don't have to you can start taking water shoots off anytime oh, okay. and then in the winter what you want to take off is before it breaks dormancy i usually look for 
dead or damaged branches, things that are crossing at bad angles. Mm -hmm. And you never want to take more than 25%, say, in a given calendar year. So remember, if you took off yeah. a bunch of water shoots, that maybe that was 5% or 10%. You want to make sure you don't overdo it. Um, but keeping the tree, you know, in the olden days, the old island trees were umbrella pruned, which was so beautiful. And apparently it was some of the, um, the Japanese farmers taught other people how to do that, the, the umbrella pruning, which is beautiful, but it also makes it so much easier to pick. <laughs> yeah, because and so that old framework, if you can sort of cut prune back to that um, and take out the big leaders and just keep the side branches, and that is going to be really helpful. Um, I have had very enthusiastic guys later say to me, gee, they didn't get any fruit. It's like, yeah, you cut every fruit and spur off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're not going to get fruit. Um, but yeah, and another thing to think about is if you planted young trees, like some of the fruit trees might take three to five years before they actually start to bloom. They're busy making roots, they're busy building structure, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're not bad. They just, they don't start blooming and fruiting early um, and, until they're established. So it, some people have worried about that, but it's not, nothing is wrong, right? We just have to be a little patient. But yeah, the kind of pruning to do now, and I clean, if, you, if you've got fruit on there, clean your clippers or your snippers or whatever you're gonna use, your little saw with a little rubbing alcohol between each cut, just to make sure, um, especially since it's getting moister, right? right? And then I usually take a little uh, mature compost and rub it into the wound, just a little, so that it's still air, it can dry clean. But that sort of puts bacteria, friendly bacteria in place or other like biota. Inoculation yeah, it's bit. kind of like a little inoculant. So we're gonna we're gonna have to cut you loose here, pretty girl. That's pretty right. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, boy, great suggestions today. You, you sure you don't wanna have one more question? All right. All right. Well, thanks everybody for showing up and, and uh, we'll yes, see you so next month. Sounds good.